Welcome to the Dividend Cafe. I am recording live in Atlanta, Georgia, where I uh, had a speaking engagement this morning, got to spend a little time with some clients, and then am speaking at a large conference on Saturday before heading up to Grand Rapids, Michigan, where I will also be with clients next week and speaking at a couple of events, participating in a large uh, symposium that I speak at every year. So I'm in the midst of a little bit of travel away from New York and away from California, but nevertheless, uh, here in Atlanta, I have created a dividend cafe that was not actually on my agenda this week initially. The subject of artificial intelligence is not exactly being ignored in the media you may have noticed and and sometimes that does take on the um the flavor of of addressing how uh much nvidia stock is going up for example and other times it has to do with all the conversation and reporting around uh, a sort of ecosystem of stocks that are involved in in ai to some degree other times there's a lot of discussion around what AI will mean for the economy, how much of our current productivity is dependent on AI, how much the current market is dependent on AI. And in circles that I traffic in, there's a fair amount of conversation, even aside from the investment implication, on what the cultural or ethical or political implications of artificial intelligence may prove to be. But I bring all that up just to simply say that this is not a topic I've ignored in, in Dividend Cafe. It's just not a topic that I write about week in and week out for the very simple reason that everybody is talking about it. And I think that what you get a lot in financial media is similar to what we get a lot in other aspects of culture, which is stuff just getting overdone, oversaturated particularly with financial media, if there's a chance to scare people a lot, the newsletter industry is almost entirely driven around trying to play into or exploit people's fear. But a lot of financial media too, can uh, more conventional media, uh, newspaper, television, uh, broadly watched, uh, broadly viewed internet sites, center around people's... Uh, I don't want to say just greed, but the hype, you know, the desire to believe that a really big investment return can come easily. Uh, the frustration that comes from believing that your friend is or neighbor is, is making money that you're not making. I mean, these things are kind of at the core of the business model of financial media and dividend cafe really doesn't exist to go into those elements of excessive fear or excessive hype that already circulate and dominate other elements of, of uh, message delivery. Uh, our content message it has a particular vision and it's not always that exciting. Uh, I'm grateful for the audience it does have, and I hope that it is scratching the itches of those that either read Dividend Cafe or those of you that watch the video or listen to the podcast. You know, obviously I care about the message being useful, but it isn't meant to be trendy. And AI is a trendy topic right now. And so it just isn't one that uh, becomes the epicenter of our efforts here at the Dividend Cafe. But I would say that in an investment context right now, I have implicitly been talking about AI quite a bit lately because I've been talking about the top heaviness of the market, for example. I've been talking about the high concentration for index investors in exposure to just a few different names that are either directly connected to a sort of AI narrative or are really heavily adjacent to an AI narrative. And so even though I think that's a more practical investment lesson, it may not seem to be a total AI conversation or narrative, and yet I think it, it is really uh, one and the same, that we're discussing the relevance of the current artificial intelligence moment on a broader level of investors. Today, I want to dig a little deeper than that. Rather than just merely talk about what I think are the embedded uh, risks that have 
materialized for index investors because of this high concentration around AI, I, I want to just sort of lay out a number of different principles um, that represent the Bonson Group's uh, a belief about the artificial intelligence moment. Some will say, how come you guys aren't invested in AI? And we would say we absolutely are invested in AI. And we can show you very particular companies and, and strategies and as to where that exposure comes from, how it has been monetized already, what that looks like going forward, the way we're thinking about all of it. But even apart from just a particular, here's on my statement where you can see that we own AI type of thing, I, I created for our purposes in today's Dividend Cafe 10 kind of takeaways or, or summaries of our thinking about the total artificial intelligence moment. Um, I'm going to just go through these in order. They're, they're listed out at DividendCafe.com and uh, we'll elaborate on each as we go. And, and, and hopefully it'll be something useful in terms of getting a better understanding of how we're thinking about the AI moment. Uh, number one is that tons of what we're talking about with AI is not new. It's been around for some time. Now, I do recognize that a lot of generative AI is newer than some of the particulars in predictive AI. And some things that I would consider a byproduct of the vast amount of research and also investment into AI wasn't really called AI then. But, you know, various components of language learning models are not totally brand new. Uh, the predictive um, elements around analytics have been around for some time and they've gotten faster. They've gotten more sophisticated and they will continue to do so. Um, this entire kind of concept of what they call multimodality, I think, is, is reasonably new in the landscape of how this conversation has come together. So the promise of the technology of AI, AI has definitely grown immensely, but I just think it's important to remember that you did not get hundreds of billions of dollars of investment, like the GDP of some countries had gone into AI in the last 24 months or 18 months or, or 12 months. This is in some cases decades in the makings. And a lot of the application of it now is newer. And, and that's the moment in which we find ourselves, um, particularly when we think about the promise of generative AI. Um, number two, and now I, I think some of these things are going to become really historical and useful, and I'm excited to unpack it. Number two is that nearly all of the investment benefits of AI thus far have been limited to what I'm going to call the backbone of AI, not the use of it. By backbone, I'm referring to the infrastructure, the tooling, the things that help make the use of it possible. Um, so companies that are using or doing AI is very different from where the investment gains have been so far, which are the companies that help to make AI possible. This is um, largely chip companies so far. And then I would argue that a pretty fair secondary example would be in certain cloud companies as well, most notably Microsoft. But nevertheless, the uh, investment gains have largely been about the infrastructure of AI so far. Number three, many of the backbone winners will prove to be losers. And this is where the history now starts to become very fascinating. There was a very similar dynamic with the advent of the internet in the 1990s. I mean, there were certainly dot-com companies going public and becoming famous and running ads at the Super Bowl and becoming uh, you doing celebrity endorsements and be, becoming kind of pop culture phenomena. But they also really were engaged in um, something that I think was very, um, it, well, let me put it this way. The dot-com moment was largely backbone driven until it wasn't. The telephone companies, cable companies, uh, wireless network companies, and then a lot of adjacent products and services that went around to that from servers, routers, etc. 
you 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 look at uh, the history of the 1990s. The the there are companies when I say backbone winners that prove to be losers. Companies that are gone altogether, like Lucent and Global Crossing. Uh, companies that are still around, but um, uh, essentially are just nobody companies. Juniper Networks, companies that went away altogether. You know, your your Sun Microsystems and Junipers and WorldComs in the 1990s were deemed to be the new big things necessary to go power the internet. And it wasn't that the thesis of backbone companies was wrong. It's just the some of those backbone companies ended up uh, proving to be losers. And and I don't think this is a byproduct of um, well anyone you know who didn't appreciate that at the time uh, was was anti technology or not keeping up with the times. You know, Warren Buffett was famously very demonized for maintaining a focus on kind of value investing. But there also is just a sense in which there were certain things that were unknowable. And that is very much the case now, in my opinion, around the AI moment relative to the way we saw this unfold with the internet. Now, number four is that many of the backbone winners uh, that will stay winners are already priced for such. This is where a company like Cisco from the 1990s and NVIDIA now becomes um, an opportunity for me to make an analogy. I've done this already multiple times. We've put the chart out in some more recent writings of ours. It's uh, it's available again today at DividendCafe.com. But it's not just simply the Cisco analogy. I mean, you had companies that are today huge winners of what took place with the internet 30 years ago and 25 years ago, et cetera. And yet, um, in almost any case you could think of experienced massive shareholder losses that, that meaning stock price drawdown that in some case never fully recovered in some case took well over 10 years um, there and and so it, it's just not as simple as identifying what the backbone sector will be or who the winners will be who the survivors will be because now the pricing itself, has sort of um, already reflected that in some cases certain companies are going to be the a significant player in whatever happens with AI, and that's been priced in and then some. Um, I, I think the charts that we use to make this point in Dividend Cafe this week are worth looking at, um, and and I think that the economic and market lesson of what took place there is not something I ever shy away from admitting that I am influenced by. It is impossible to not have found that message for a professional money manager out of the 1990s into the last 25 years I've been professionally managing money to have not found it to be a potent message that a company can succeed as massively as Microsoft and Cisco did and yet suffer the way they did in terms of stock price as a direct byproduct of what was simply happening with the pricing of their stock before. I just mentioned two companies as a random example. I could mention a dozen, and that's just in the realm of ones who actually made it, who flourished as active operators in the business. There's a whole graveyard of other companies that also participated in a big run-up and didn't make it that are now basically either gone or irrelevant. Um, number five, predictions about how AI will change things, who will benefit from the change, and how this will all play out will be riddled with error. This is not merely a byproduct about it's going to be hard to pick who the backbone winners will be. That was sort of what number four and three were about. But now you're getting into kind of other components that require certain presuppositions and how or, or, or assumptions and how we think about the, this story playing out that are going to open ourselves up to fallibility. Um, an example I use from the internet era was the notion that, well, you know, less and less people now you can get wireless through a mobile device. So you saw a huge downward pricing in PCs 
and a huge escalation in the pricing of mobile phone units. And we remember the names of Motorola, Nokia. And it's so funny to think about because Nokia and Motorola were not killed by the iPhone. They, they, you know, then BlackBerry comes around and then iPhone kills BlackBerry. And there was a lot of creative destruction going on in sequentially. You know, certain uh, company, you talk about Darwin, Darwinian uh, uh, business model, a business cycle. Some companies were killing others and then getting killed. And this was happening rapidly. And you think about it now, like, was that laptop theory wrong? Gateway is gone. The multi, multi, multi billion dollar company that in 2007 got sold for $700 million and then is totally gone now. Um, after, so it goes down, you know, 90% in value and then gets swiped up, wiped away. But then Hewlett Packard right now is a $40 billion company. It's not at an all-time high, but it's very near it. So the laptop theory itself wasn't fully understood or executed well. And then you look at within the phone component. Well, I, people were right. The advent of wireless technology was going to totally change the rules of the game around phones. But that didn't stop Ericsson and Nokia and Motorola from joining the graveyard. And that's the point I'm making is that there's going to be a lot of opportunities out of AI to get certain um, sub-narratives wrong and to get specifics within sub-narratives wrong. And, and that's been the lesson of history. It's going to be very humbling, in my opinion. Number six, greater fool theory applied to artificial intelligence investing will make fools of those who employ it. What is greater fool theory? It's the idea that the underlying investment merit doesn't matter, that as long as you have someone uh, who's a greater fool than you are to sell it to, who cares how good of a company it is or who, good, who cares how good of an investment thesis something is, as long as someone else believes it's good, that idea of being able to sell, to move your hot potato to someone else at a profit, that's really what the game is about. And obviously, greater fool theory works until it doesn't. As long as you buy something at X and sell it to someone else for much more than X, again, the key word being that you sold it to somebody at much more than X. But greater fool theory is by definition not sustainable, and eventually the music stops playing. And I think in this particular case, those who are holding on for dear life and believing that they're going to find uh, the last sucker to sell something to, as opposed to being the last sucker, I think they have another thing coming. And greater fool theory is a foolish theory of investing. Number seven, principles are what you apply in terms, in times of decision making, not the things you end up with out of decisions. You don't make decisions and then say, okay, so these things now become my principles. You have principles that drive the way you make decisions. Fad-oriented, popularity-oriented, momentum-oriented um, decision-making is not principle-driven. And I suppose someone could say my principle is that I'm just going to change whatever I do based on uh, the weather of the moment um, and trying to adjust around it. Perhaps that could be one's principle. It, history has not been kind to those who have practiced such. Number eight, speaking of history, this time is different is what people always say before it ends up not being different. And this is always a very difficult lesson to remind people of in investing because you only get to point out that, oh, look, this time wasn't different and this thing ended up happening and so forth and so on. You only get to do that with hindsight. Until such and such a thing plays out, it does feel like this time may be different. But the problem with this time is different is that it isn't ever different and that there you are delaying the inevitable. Um, obviously, some companies succeed. There's nothing about this time is different that says some companies can't go from very small to very big. Companies grow into their valuation, they exceed expectations, they evolve, they innovate. There are success stories all over the place, including some that we on occasion would miss. However, the part I'm referring to is the belief that, that substantially overstretched valuations that draw in the hysteria 
of the population that those things don't end up with a reckoning that this time is different that that i am unaware of an exception to the rule in in history number nine the only thing that will prove more wrong than predictions about ai investing are predictions about ai's impact on society i am a shamptarian to my core the understanding about creative destruction as a vital inevitable and ultimately fruitful part of a market economy is uh, very much at the core of my belief system. And yet I think that when we look at conversations and sometimes hand wringing that is going on about AI right now, um, it confuses the macro for the micro. There will be some individuals who lose their jobs because of AI, but on a macro and broader base system, it will create more jobs than it loses. And I'm thoroughly convinced of this. I'm thoroughly convinced that various fears of sort of dystopian consequences um, are part of the same category people have been afraid of with technology forever. I think there will be bad mistakes made. I think there will be egregious violations of ethics that take place along the way. There will be law breaking. There will be some regulation. There will be some re-regulation. Some of it will be good. Some of it will be bad. Um, this whole thing will play out in a certain way, but the predictions about AI's impact on society right now um, and what its ultimate utility will prove to be, I think, are, are going to end up being very different than people expect. And then this brings me to my final number 10, which is, I think, ultimately most practical for uh, clients of the Bonson Group. Artificial intelligence can be invested in within a dividend growth framework. In fact, it ought to be invested in within a dividend growth framework. My view is that trying to be immunized as much as possible from the lessons I talked about earlier regarding uh, the fallibility of how a lot of these things will play out, the fact that there are backbone companies that are different than utilizers of it, that there are adjacent companies that will get caught up in the moment and some will fail and some will succeed and some will succeed but already be overpriced. There's all these sort of historical and economical realities at play. And to be as reasonably immunized from that as possible, to attach an artificial intelligence investment framework to cash flow strikes me as a very prudent idea. Having, um, as we do in our own portfolio, multiple companies that stand to benefit in either a backbone or adjacent backbone capacity to AI, yet without the risk of an 80% drawdown because it is uh, tangential and not the core of the entire business, I think is a very sensible way to be engaged. And then ultimately to actually invest in companies that will use AI as a tool, but don't make AI as a backbone provider. Um, the analogy that I used in the Dividend Cafe written this week that I don't think I've shared here so far in our recording is if, if AI were food, you're talking about right now all the investment being in the people who make the ovens, not the restaurants. Ultimately, AI has to actually be a restaurant if it's food. It has to get served out in some way. It has to be used and, and be a meaningful component. And there is and is going to be utility around the ability of generative AI to drive efficiency and productivity in an actual real life business. But right now, when people are talking about, oh, I'm invested in AI, and they're referring to a chip maker, for example, they're talking about the oven. And that is not the heart of the restaurant, okay? I still think the AI moment is going to be in a lot of the basic companies we own that if I were to say the name of them, you'd say, well, what does that do AI? And it would say the way in which they're utilizing AI in driving a different impact and result and process in their business. It's a point I've made before, but you have to understand that all of us today who use the internet on a daily basis, as I do, use social media, um, you know, you don't own AOL and Yahoo and Lucent and CompuServe and Juniper um, in your portfolio anymore. The ways in which the internet has now become vital in the way we do business is evidenced 
in every company you could think of from a railroad to 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 a utility to a restaurant to a financial company etc across all the sectors of the S&P the internet is being utilized that's the way i want to think about ai so it is untrue to say that a dividend growth methodology will be uninvested in ai it will be invested in the application of ai the delivery of food not just merely the manufacturing of ovens and yet along the way there is still a backbone ai investment with companies that do not end up representing 80% of the portfolio, a smaller amount, but are far more mitigated against the risk of excess and valuation that I've talked about earlier. So I hope that makes sense. I want to be invested in companies who use AI to the betterment of their own profits. And those profits will come to our clients in what we call dividends. That is the way we view AI investing as compatible with dividend growth investing. I appreciate you bearing with me on all 10 of these lessons. I mentioned there are some good charts at dividendcafe.com as always. So I'll, I'll refer you to that property. And I'll close with the quote of the week in this week's Dividend Cafe from Charles Mackey. Men, it has been well said, think in herds. It will be seen that they go mad in herds while they recover their senses slowly and one by one. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And thank you for reading The Dividend Cafe. Have a wonderful weekend. Mm -hmm.